update on Nation to Nation, Senator Patrick Berzeau is in studio to talk about his goal to put warning labels on alcohol products. That the uh, small consumption of alcohol uh, can cause uh, up to seven types of fatal cancers. Berzeau also discusses his past struggles with addictions. He says he looked to his mother and the spirits for help. Asking him a sign or asking me to give me the strength to quit drinking because I was just, I've had enough. New Brunswick is set to end a tax deal with several First Nations that had been in place for decades. But this, you know, really affects the nation-to-nation -nation relationship. Ani, welcome to Nation to Nation. I'm Annette Francis. It's well known that drinking a lot of alcohol is bad for you, but the Canadian Centre on Substance Use and Addiction made headlines a week ago when it said no amount of alcohol is safe. This follows in the footsteps of years of studies that link alcohol to several types of fatal cancers. That's why Senator Patrick Brazo sponsored Bill S-254 back in the fall. He joins us now to talk about this bill and why it's so important. Welcome, Senator Brazo. Thank you for having me. So you introduced a bill in November um, wanting labels on alcohol products. Why have consumers not been, uh, are they not getting this information? Well, first of all, um, you know, I introduced this bill uh, because, uh, first of all, because of my own personal struggles uh, with alcohol abuse. Um, but uh, having said that, I will be celebrating uh, uh, three years of sobriety this coming March 29th. But uh, the reason I, I, I want to introduce this bill is because of my personal problems. I, I had started uh, back in 2016 uh, to do some research about alcohol and the negative impacts of alcohol because we all know it's not good. We all know it's a poison, but I want to, uh, to dig a little bit deeper. And I came across some uh, Canadian research done by researchers uh, from the University of Victoria here in Canada uh, about the negative impacts uh, of alcohol and uh, to my surprise I found myself to be one in I, I found myself to be one of 25 percent of Canadians who are aware that the uh, small consumption of alcohol uh, can cause uh, up to seven types of fatal cancers and so when I saw that number uh, and I immediately thought of you know First Nations uh, citizens all across the country and indigenous citizens because we know because of generational trauma and uh, residential schools we know that unfortunately many of our peoples turn to substances to uh, you know to camouflage to hide their pain because at the end of the day it's all about people living in pain and and I know that now this is such important information why why is it that this information has not been out to to the consumers? Well, I think uh, first and foremost, I think it's uh, certainly a, it should be a responsibility of the alcohol industry uh, to put labels on the product that they're selling to consumers. And, and it's important that, you know, the alcohol has been um, uh, labeled a class one carcinogen since 1988. So a class one carcinogen, just like tobacco and, and asbestos, yet in Canada, Alcohol is the only um, product uh, where, where there's no warning uh, labels or uh, there's no information as to what is in the cans or the bottles, etc. And so I think it's important now in 2023 to, to start having a, a real discussion on alcohol uh, and its negative impacts because uh, it's, not, it's certainly not helping indigenous peoples, and, but not just indigenous peoples. There's a lot of people who are suffering and, and abusing alcohol. And, you know, um, this piece of legislation is not telling people what they should be doing or not doing, what they should be drinking or not drinking. Uh, rather, it's so that consumers, just like cigarettes, packages of cigarettes, uh, you know, they can read exactly what's in the product and they can make more informed decisions for themselves. But, you know, that information, I believe, um, you know, for the betterment and for health reasons for, for all Canadians, uh, it should be, uh, there should be clear warning signs that uh, the consumption of alcohol can cause cancer. So uh, what have, how have your efforts been received as far as uh, labeling goes? Well, uh, so far, uh, you know, we've uh, we started receiving some some support. Uh, for example, uh, the Canadian Cancer Society, who, who are supportive of this. Uh, you know, there there are a lot of um, uh, uh, medical and uh, health uh, people who work in health-related fields who are, you know, uh, sending emails and lending their support. And and some of them have started writing to uh, other senators because you know part of this work I introduced this bill in the Senate. So, uh, you know, what I need to do is is to ensure uh, that we 
I get to a, a place and a spot where we, we have a vote uh, on this piece of legislation, so I have to convince uh, the majority of, of senators. And if I can do that, then it would go to the House of Commons where uh, the elected officials would, uh, would take a look at this uh, piece of legislation. But the important is to start having this debate. Uh, I think it's needed. I think it's important. Again, it's, it's about fighting cancer. It's not about fighting the alcohol industry because alcohol has existed since probably the beginning of time. Um, but I'm starting to think that perhaps cancer has also existed uh, since the beginning of time uh, because of alcohol. So, you know, for, for all throughout my years uh, on this earth, uh, we've, we've been looking for, uh, you know, um, something to, uh, to, to, to either prevent or to cure cancer. We're looking for a cure and we have not found one. But, you know, we found preventable measures in, in putting uh, labels on cigarette packaging and hopefully now uh, uh, alcohol, uh, our alcohol products here in Canada. A Liberal Member of Parliament tabled a similar bill, um, private member's bill, back in 2005. That bill did not get passed. Um, at the time, it was uh, discussed that labels were ineffective. How confident are you that Bill S-254 will not fail? Well, I, I'm confident that uh, Bill S-254 will not fail because, um, you know, no, because of no reason of mine or, you know, I still have about approximately, if my health uh, maintains, I still have about 27 years uh, in the Senate. And uh, if we go back uh, 25, 30 years ago, uh, when this happened with the tobacco companies, well, it took about 20, 25 years for that fight. And so I'm, I'm looking forward for that fight. I'm, 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 I'm up for it. Uh, but having said that, I think that um, I, I don't think it's going to take 20, 25 years because I think that uh, especially with the younger youth and uh, more and more youth uh, n not drinking as much as perhaps uh, people in my generation are a little bit older. Uh, so I think that's that's a positive thing. But, uh, you know, I you know, this is an issue that uh, that is near and dear to my heart. It's both professionally and uh, and personally. And uh, but I, I want to see this through because I, I think it's it's you know I think if we have uh, clear warning labels on alcoholic products in Canada, it it will certainly save lives. And and to me, uh, that's uh, that's a positive thing. Canadians learn a lot about food and drinks through labels, except for alcohol. Consuming bees does not raise the risk of developing seven fatal cancers, Madam Speaker but consuming alcohol does. After the break, we'll have more with Senator Patrick Brazil. Welcome back. We continue our conversation with Senator Patrick Brazil. You've had your own personal struggles. It's been well documented since becoming a uh, senator in 2009. How have those, uh, how has those experiences in, in your life, how were you able to move beyond that and how have those experiences helped you or do they help you in your day-to-day -day work as a senator? You know, let me tell you a story. I, I, I sort of had a vision uh, or something very special happened to me um, back in 2020. Uh, you know, the pandemic had just started and I was trying to organize a, or an international uh, uh, smudging day uh, because people were a little bit worried about what was happening and people were a bit scared. But So I tried to, um, uh, to organize that. And uh, so on the 27th of March 2020, I went out and smudged uh, early in the morning. And at the same time, I was, I was talking and praying to my mom and I was also talking to the spirits and asking them a sign or asking me to give me the strength to quit drinking because I was just, I've had enough. And when you, when you hit the bottom or when you see the, you know, the, when you see the, the total darkness, um, you know, I, I'm just lucky to be alive today uh, because I did wake up from an induced coma two days after I tried to commit suicide. And, you know, perhaps, perhaps the, the silver lining is that's what it needed to happen to me to be able to be a, a stronger spokesperson for this. But coming back to my, uh, my, my vision, asking for help uh, to quit drinking, um, on the next day, the 28th of March, I had, a, I had a few drinks, but on the 29th, I had just decided I wasn't going to drink that day. I, I, hadn't, I hadn't put it in my mind that I was going to quit drinking forever. And to make a long story short, after the 29th of March, it was one day after another, and it just the snowball effect. So I'm sitting with you here today because I, on the 27th of March 2020, I had asked for a sign. I had asked for, for help in my prayer. 
And today I, I, I know that I received that, that, uh, that sign two days after I had asked for it, but I didn't know then. But I know that now, and, and that's what has given me the strength and the, and the power to, to fight every day. Because, you, know, you know, it's not because you, I've been sober for almost three years that, that, it, that, it's, that, that it's easy. I mean, there are some really, really, really hard days. But, but you know, I, wanted, I know I want to do this for, for, uh, you know, for my family and, you know, for, for my children and, and, and for myself. Uh, because, you know, I, I matter too, uh, you know. And, um, you know, these, these are the types of barriers that need to be broken down because, you know, there's too many of our people suffering. And, you know, it's time that, uh, it's time that we, uh, we start doing uh, something about it collectively. And, you know, I'm just a little dot on the wall, and, but I'm just trying to do uh, what I can with the, with the capabilities and the, uh, the experiences uh, that I now have. You've become an advocate for better mental health and suicide prevention uh, for Indigenous peoples. Uh, you even spoke at a committee about your experiences. Um, what do you see what needs to be done? What, what more needs to be offered to, to help, especially in prevention services? We know that uh, Indigenous peoples, First Nations people, have uh, as high as uh, seven times more of a likelihood of committing suicide than non-Indigenous Canadians. And in some Inuit communities, it could go up as high as 27 percent higher. And so we had many experts come before this committee, um, experts into suicide prevention. But, and you know, what, what, what uh, struck at me was that many of these experts were saying that, you know, there was no increase in suicides across Canada. But if you take away, ex if you extrapolate the indigenous suicides from the non-indigenous suicides in Canada, Everybody, everybody who works in this field and everybody who would take a look at this would see that there's, there's a crisis in Canada. There's, there's a suicide crisis in Canada and provincial governments and the federal government don't care. And if we look at residential schools uh, 100 years ago, well, they knew what was going on and they did nothing about it. it today, in 2023, it's, it's the, the, the issues coming out of residential schools and, and people are hurting and they're not getting the help that they deserve and governments know this. So this, this is my fear because I've been, I've been around in, in the mainstream and indigenous politics for the last 20 years and you know, I've gained a lot of experience in those 20 years and you know, I, you know there is a crisis and um, you know, the committee will probably be releasing the, their, uh, their report um, in the next few months, so I look forward to, uh, to taking part uh, in that because I, I was a member of that committee and I also had uh, requested to, uh, to appear as a witness because I, was, I thought it was important to share my own personal experiences to, uh, to try and help others, but also to, to bring, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, the information before the experts so that they can start tackling with Indigenous suicides. And w let's not mask and hide you know, indigenous suicides with every other suicide because it, it, it hides facts. Mm -hmm. And so this is why it's, this is near and dear to me because, you know, you know just a couple of years ago, there was uh, 12 uh, attempted suicides in, in, in the Algonquin community of Rapid Lake. Um, in just a matter of a few weeks, that's not normal. If that were to occur in, in any other area across Canada and non-indigenous non community, they would call it a crisis and there would be immediate help. So this, this is why it's important to, to keep on working on these issues because, you know, if, if we don't do it, a lot of people will continue suffering and, you know, may not have any opportunity at getting any type of help and, and, and that would be unfortunate. You spoke earlier about um, efforts every day to, to keep on, on track for yourself as well. How, how, what do you find helps? What, what keeps you on that? on that good track? Um, you know, I used to be part of a, um, a political party and, you know, I went through, uh, you know, a, a scandal that they created uh, to throw me under the bus and that wasn't easy to live with, but, um, but, I, but I survived it. And, uh, you know, what keeps me going uh, ever since uh, that March 27th, 2020, I, I smudge uh, every uh, single day and, you know, I just uh, give thanks every day because uh, that I'm alive and that I can do what I can to, to try and give back because, uh, you know, once I, I truly believe that once people get involved in politics is, is to do something good, is to, you know, do, you know, bring, bring some, some good to people. And, uh, you know, that's all I'm trying to do. And, um, and uh, you know, it's, 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 it's hard work, but it's, 
it's worthwhile and also what has also helped and you know when I was healing uh, you know there was a lot of negative people uh, again and you know when you're trying to get up and people are trying to kick you down well I uh, I made uh, you know I had to make some tough decisions and I, I got rid of uh, some of those negative people because uh, you know, I, you know, I'm just not going to allow negative people to uh, to bring me down again because I, I deserve to be here. I'm trying to do the best that I can, and uh, you know, now that I've uh, gone uh, through hell and back, uh, you know, I'm just trying to give back and uh, the, the best that I can. And you know, if I can save a life or two along the way, then you know, it would be my pleasure to do that because uh, you know, I know what I'm talking about now because of of this experience. And if I can share my experiences to help others, then that's that's what I'm all about. Wow. Well, thank you very much, and congratulations on your sobriety. Well, thank you for having me, and thank you very much to APTN and uh, your viewers for taking an interest in, uh, in this subject matter. It's important. Stay tuned. Coming up after the break, we'll be talking taxes. Welcome back. Six First Nations in New Brunswick have been involved in tax revenue sharing agreements with the province since the 1990s in return for charging and collecting provincial taxes from on-reserve businesses at the same rate as off-reserve. The province sent back 5% of the revenue. The funds were then used as each First Nation saw fit to help address social issues and build on-reserve housing. The latest 10-year agreement is set to expire at the end of this month. And with a soured relationship between both parties, it looks like this may be the last one. New Brunswick Premier Blaine Higgs says the agreement gave First Nations an unfair advantage. And they created a two-tier tax system. Joining us now to talk about the issue is Chief Alan Polchis, Jr. of the Zidanzik First Nation, located across the St. John River from downtown Fredericton. Welcome, Chief Polchis. Quay, good afternoon. So the chief of another Wolastuque uh, First Nation, uh, Chief Patricia Bernard, says the lack of this revenue will cause great upheaval. Why is that? Well, it's because you know, for budgeting purposes, when we're, of course, you know, planning for our future, you know, the investments that we, we, we put in my own community, we put investments of $15 million in housing. So now, you know, and, and with that long-term planning, you know, with that revenue coming in, that gave us sustainability to offer housing. And as you know, housing in First Nation communities is very minimal. But in my community, with this tax agreement, you know, we were able to build anywhere from 10 to 20 homes a year, you know, and that's a lot of homes. That's, you know, given a lot of families to that. Now, you know, taking back the, uh, the, the tax agreements is, is going to, we have to really look at the, 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 uh, the picture of our, uh, of our uh, communities to see what's going to be sustainable and what's not and how we can plan for a future, for our future generations. Okay, Premier Higgs has been against this tax sharing agreement since 2014, citing it was unfair to the majority of voters. How do you respond to that? Well, Premier Higgs wants to replace these agreements with a system where First Nations come to the government with a, a specific funding request and the provincial government will decide if the request gets any funding. You know, so the premier wants us to be uh, to be fair. We've been fair. We've been fair for a number of years by doing our by doing our contributions by, of course, upholding the agreements that the government of the day has put into place. And you know, we're. 25% of my workforce is non-Indigenous. So we take 25% of the folks here in the Fredericton and we take them off the social system. You know, we're giving them livelihoods. You know, we're training them. We're using our own resources to do that. You know, but not to mention, you know, when I'm building all these homes, where do you think I get the supplies from? I don't have a lumber house in my backyard. 
You know, we're we're we're, we're supporting all the businesses in town. A large majority majority of our revenues are going back into the system, and those folks are also paying tax. We pay tax all the time. You know, it's just a matter of uh, it's just a, it's just a matter of uh, how it's it's rolled out and our contribution to society. How much money is involved? Like, um, can you give us a dollar sense of how much of a loss that could be for First Nations? Well, there's, uh, in total of the six communities, uh, we're looking at about $60 million. You know, uh, this, this, the, the, this province just announced a $775 million surplus. Um, you know, that's a huge surplus for this province. You know, we're part of contributing to that surplus because it was a 95-5 split. And that's what's been working for our communities for 20 plus years. So, you know, the, the current government feels that they want to be paternalistic. They want to work with us, but they want us to open our books. And our books are open. As you know, to the uh, First Nations um, um, reporting with with is um, you know it's all on it's all on our websites it's they have all the information there so you know for the government to come through and, and want us to write what they what they think we need you know they want us uh, uh, they want us to tell them what we want we know what we want how will this affect your community financially and and uh, what will you do next well, you know, what will happen next is that we are looking at ways to, of course, uh, insert our inherent rights um, and to ensure that, you know, sections of the Indian Act are going to be acted upon to allow us to, of course, uh, do tobacco, gaming, and any other uh, revenue streams that were going to be affected. You know, we're here in an urban setting, so of course, you know, one of the big one of the big reasons why um, these tax agreements came into play in 1994 was because, you know, they wanted us to remain um, not competitive, but they wanted us to remain, um, you know, equal partners in in the industry to make sure that you know we were selling our gas at the same price as the urbans down the street, for example, or selling our cigarettes for the exact same price down, you know, that the uh, other businesses were, you know, equal players in in the field, and that was fair. That was fair because we could undercut. As First Nations, we can undercut these businesses, sell the gas and cigarettes to whatever price, and then we can attract all that business coming to our community. And it would be a big mess in, you know, in the in the business sense in here in, in, in Fredericton, because like I said, we're here in the, in an urban setting. But you know, we 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 came to the table to play, and we played fair all these years. We always did all of our reporting. We always did, you know, uh, remitted all of the taxes every single time and you know been, been able to have those uh, uh, you know open conversations but this you know really affects the nation and nation relationship you know when they talk about reconciliation the province of New Brunswick you know uh, really doesn't understand that word okay right? thank you chief we'll leave it there Be okay quick. thank you take care of your spirit that's all we have for this week's Nation to Nation. If you missed any part of tonight's show, you can check out our website at aptnnews.ca or our podcast at aptnnews.ca slash podcast. Miigwech, have a good night.